Welcome. It's great to be here again for another uh, live q and I'd like to begin by once again uh, uh, thanking all my subscribers, all my viewers, and all my Patreon supporters. Uh, so as always, we'll begin with uh, the questions from uh, uh, the Patreon supporters. And so let's get to them. Uh, this is always so uh, so interesting and enjoyable, and I've noticed that the, uh, the questions are getting uh, very, uh, very incisive and very perspicacious. So that's really, really impressive. Okay, so the first question is uh, from Patreon supporter uh, Mackenzie Levitt. And um, the question is, what is the most useful way to characterize the relationship between mind and brain? So uh, thank you, Mackenzie, for your support. Um, so th that's a that's a very, very uh, uh, <laughs> hard question. Uh, you, you could say and I think it would not be uh, dismissive. You could say that almost all of my work as a cognitive science, scientist is directed towards trying to answer that question. If you'd asked me that um, when I was in grad school or shortly, shortly thereafter, I would have given sort of a classic answer uh, like Jerry Fodor uh, would give and say that the mind is the software and the brain is the hardware. And uh, like you can make the distinction between, like for example, word, and then what's happening, right? Uh, which is a way in which you're organizing information processing as a program that can be moved around to different hardware, and whereas the hardware is the actual, you know, physical stuff inside the machine. Um, and while I think there's some uh, important kernel of truth in that, I think um, the relationship is now moved. Sorry, I would now characterize the relationship in a way that has moved beyond that computational metaphor. Whereas I think of the mind's relationship to the brain as the mind is a dynamical system that is being run. It can be implemented on many different material platforms, but that dynamical system is not just in the head, uh, in the brain. It's between the brain and the body and between the brain, body uh, the embodied brain and uh, the world um, in, uh, in a form of dynamical coupling. Um, and so uh, just to give you a, perhaps a different analogy then, instead of it like being the software hardware distinction, you can think of a dynamical system as something uh, like, uh, as I've sometimes used, like combustion. Uh, combustion is a uh, self-organizing system. Uh, but, you know, it, you, it can run on different things, and that's why you can catch fire with wood, and then the fire can spread to other material, and the combustion, right, it isn't locked to a particular uh, material implication. It has to be connected to and implemented in something material, but it's not reducible uh, to that material uh, property. So that's how I would answer that. The problem with answering that question that way, though, uh, just to be uh, as fair to the question as possible, is the word mind is very equivocal. You could be referring to intelligence, in which I think um, what we're talking about, uh, the mind is uh, a dynamical system that's running relevance realization on the embodied embedded brain. Um, you could be talking about consciousness, which I think is a higher order thing, etc. So I'm answering the question sort of very abstractly, so it would cover uh, um, both intelligence and consciousness, and so that's why I'm answering it somewhat abstractly in terms of it's a dynamical system um, that is running um, on the embodied and embedded brain insofar as you are enacting sensory motor behavior um, as you attempt to solve problems and achieve your goals. Uh, so uh, that's the that's the that's sort of my my uh, sort of overall abstract answer to that question. Like I say. I think at times a better way to answer that question, which I don't have time for right now, is to go in and, and I tried to give one example of it, answer one of them, like what's intelligence and then perhaps what's consciousness and then more difficult, well, uh, what, is the, what is the self, uh, uh, what's that, what, what kind of relationship that is, does it bear to the brain? Uh, but uh, I, I'm at least trying to give you a, an overall response. So thank you very much for uh, that question. Uh, Answering that question is kind of, and answer that, answering that question not only for each one, intelligence, consciousness, the self, but being able to answer that you know, for each and all in an integrated manner, I think is the primary goal that defines cognitive science as discipline. So I'm saying that to indicate to you that um, I'm giving you what I think is the best proposal for how we will eventually be able to answer that question. Uh, I need you to understand that it's, of course, controversial. 
um, and that it's not something that we have completed. Cognitive science is not in any way finished, uh, uh, in, in a position to claim to have finished answering that question uh, by any means. Okay, so let's move to the next question. So this is also uh, from Mackenzie, and this is, what is your favorite example of a film that symbolizes uh, the meaning crisis? Uh, that's, that's very good. Uh, there's, it depends what, by what you mean. Um, I like the matrix insofar as it represents the meaning crisis, um, but also portrays Neoplatonism and Gnosticism as the answer to the meaning crisis. So the way the meaning crisis is symbolized, right, is of course he feels, and then this is when, in the, uh, when Neo has a discussion with Morpheus and he talks about how, he, you know, he, things just don't feel right. It's like a splinter in his mind. Um, and, and, and that's very much a way of trying to get at the phenomenology of the meaning crisis, that sense of, that gnawing sense of being out of sorts and out of place and disconnected from oneself and reality. And then what's interesting is that that's metaphor, then that that is understood in, in through the metaphor, the, the Gnostic metaphor, the Neoplatonic metaphor of the cave, uh, the cave that has becoming the entrapped, um, the entrapping prison. And so that brings with it also a sense of entrapment, uh, which I sometimes wonder is that perhaps sometimes the people who are uh, criticizing uh, physicalism uh, from um, a religious perspective, if one of their motives is um, they feel that physicalism is not adequately uh, representing um, their sense of entrapment, um, of existential entrapment. And if that is the case, I'm, I'm, I'm putting that out as a potential um, hypothesis to explore in discussion with people, um, then I would like to enter into a discussion with people uh, about that and, and see um, if there's a way of addressing it. Um, I think also uh, the Truman Show, is one of my favorites as well. Um, and obviously the pun is uh, in his name is meant to be taken seriously. Um, it also has a sort of a Gnostic theme. He's trapped um, in an inauthentic existence. And then there's the quest to try and get connection to himself, uh, to someone he genuinely loves and to the world as it really is. Um, and of course that again uh, represents uh, some of the main things that people are doing when they're trying to respond uh, to the meaning crisis. I think also, uh, and so calling it favorite might be the wrong adjective, but I think a movie that I take very seriously and I've been writing uh, uh, some uh, wiki, uh, wiki letters with David Chapman about this and Andrew Sweeney has been commenting on those as well in some really um, brilliant ways, um, uh, is Joker. Uh, and what, what I one of the things I'm trying to explore is how Joker represents a shift uh, from the zombie mythos as a primary way of understanding the meaning crisis, which is the sort of amorphous collective horde, um, to an individual who um, represents malevolent narcissism uh, taken to um, its final sort of form of degradation. See, narcissism represents all that's left of relevance realization is um, relevance to the self, uh, a very, you know, the, the sort of primitive uh, initiating aspects of relevance realization. And the Joker, right, is of course disconnected, radically disconnected, I'll try not to do any spoilers here, radically disconnected from himself, his world, um, the, the people that are supposed to be the individuals he loves. So he's clearly suffering from it. But what he does is he, he represents a shift towards, um, some, and I think it represents a shift that we're seeing in our socio-political uh, culture, um, which is the shift towards a malevolent kind of absurdism. Because one of the things that narcissism can do uh, to defend its last ditch gasp of uh, trying to maintain connection um, is to cover the absurdity of its, you know, of itself. Narcissism is an inherently absurd position. It, it can, it tries to cover that absurdity by making as much of the world absurd around it. And in that way, the suffering of the disjunct uh, between the absurdity of narcissism and the intelligibility um, and value and significance of reality is undermined post-truth and all that stuff. And, and thereby, um, the, right, the, 
the, the difference between the absurd inner life of the narcissist and the world in which they are dwelling is completely flattened. And I think we see that happening um, in, in Joker. So um, the shift there, the, it may be, I don't know if it's going to be a comprehensive shift, but the potential to have shifted from the zombie mythos to the Joker mythos as a way of articulating a new way in which people are appropriating and uh, in experiencing and interpreting the meaning crisis, I think is something that we should all pay very careful attention to, uh, particularly, of course, because of the intimate connection between uh, the Joker's program and random chaotic violence. So, the next question is from the Patreon Mike. Uh, most people see themselves in a world in terms of being a subject in a world of other objects. Is the split between self and other hardwired into it, or is it something that can be overcome with the right spiritual practice? Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Mike, for your support and for your excellent question. So that's a difficult question. Uh, it's, a, it's a question that I'm, I'm actually working on um, right now. Um, I've done some work with um, an RA, Elizabeth Long. Um, I'm also doing uh, some other current work uh, on this. Uh, this this question of the the, the self. Uh, it's work I'm doing with um, uh, Dan Craig and Madeline Abramian on uh, the cognitive continuum from insight to enlightenment. So there's a sense in which um, the subject object distinction. Uh, uh, which is, of course, was valorized uh, uh, by uh, Aristotle into uh, the sort of fundamental logic of his metaphysics. Um, there's a sense in which we can overcome that, um, in that we can move to uh, forms of cognition that do not depend on a subject predicate uh, format in order to be processed, which is the core of propositional processing. Um, but you, you might say, well, even uh, in sort of procedural and perspectival states like flow where you're feeling at one there's still maybe a sort of a fundamental uh, uh, orientation difference between sort of here and there um, and of course that itself can also disappear uh, when you get into a state called the pure consciousness event in which there is no distinction between inner and outer between self and others um, so that there are states we can get into that progressively move us on a continuum where the sense of the egoic autobiographical self and inner and outer, those various phenomenological aspects of self and other uh, can definitely be uh, reduced. And in some state, uh, in some states, uh, they seem to disappear. I've experienced it myself. Um, however, I do not think that that, then means that the self in terms of its functionality disappears. So if we take the machinery of the self to be ultimately um, the processes uh, by which uh, this organism uh, manages um, manages um, the combinatorial explosion of information available to it um, and does framing, um, I don't think we can move to a state in which we are frameless and we're not framing. I don't think that makes any sense. And so in that sense, they, we are always in, we're always, so I, I'm suspicious of people who claim that they, can, they completely have no self. Um, and um, if that, if what they mean by that is there's no process uh, by which relevance realization is going on, um, I don't know what that is or why you want it. I don't know what it is to be, oh, what, what, what the state looks like, if, even, if it could even be called a mental state at all, in which one is completely overwhelmed by combinatorial explosion and why that would in any way be something that one thought. Um, so I think there's always, in this sense, the machinery of the self that is the machinery of framing in a self-organizing fashion. I don't think there's some soul behind that, uh, but, uh, to, to put my cards on the table and be honest with people, I don't think there's anything beyond the self-organizing processes. I don't think there's anything to the self in its deep fundamental uh, machinery beyond the self-organizing of, uh, of the framing that's happening in relevance realization. And in that sense, I think there's always uh, an inner and an outer 
there's distinctions going on for processing. Now, phenomenologically, you may not be experiencing any, any inner and outer, but I'm pretty sure, because uh, I've studied the pure consciousness event, uh, that you're still, because it still has salience in it, it still has a sense of fearness, a nowness, a unity to it. These are all, in fact, uh, venerated in the traditions. Um, that, to me, indicates that relevance realization is still going on, and therefore there's there's still the distinction between what's in the frame and what is outside the frame, which has been indispensably excluded from processing so that your cognition is not overwhelmed by a combinatorial explosion of information and options, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we should be careful in, and I've made this point before, we should be very careful in moving from our phenomenology to our theoretical explanations of functionality. The, the, we should not simply import from phenomenology to functionality. The fact that there are phenomenological states of consciousness in which the autobiographical self disappears and even the sense of inner and outer experience disappears, I've experienced those myself, doesn't leave me to conclude, for reasons that I've just argued, that the, 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 the sort of functioning machinery uh, of the self, uh, uh, the self-organization of relevance realization that gives your cognition its coherent, integrated, and developmental uh, abilities, I don't think that uh, can be uh, made to disappear by any spiritual practice. Now, the, the question then, of course, remains, uh, which ones are relevant to our sapiential and our moral development? Um, I think overcoming, you know, biases of egocentrism, getting more flexible in our perspectival framing, um, uh, all these kinds of things uh, uh, can be improved um, in a significant way. And I, insofar as these altered states uh, facilitate uh, a, a, an enhancement of our cognitive functioning such that we can address perennial problems of self-deception and self-destructive behavior. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's the that's the normative standard by which we should evaluate um, these claims to removing the subject object uh, distinction. Um, and um, I'm not sure if there is any other independent normativity that we could bring to bear. Uh, to evaluate those kinds of claims. So uh, that's my best attempt uh, to answer that question. That's a really good question. Um, and I'm going to be talking a lot more in, uh, after Socrates about different kinds of self-knowledge and uh, the, the, the very great difference between, between, for example, knowing your autobi yourself autobiographically and then becoming metacognitively aware the self-awareness of of your, your right of your of your awareness um, that kind of uh, direct procedural perspectival metacognition. So we're going to talk a lot about that in uh, in after Socrates. So hopefully that will also give uh, some more uh, conceptual uh, vocabulary and theoretical grammar to wrestle uh, with the perennial problem of uh, what should we think about the uh, our adherence to and the nature of the self. So I'd like to turn to uh, another Patreon supporter, uh, Sergey McCarran, uh, sorry, uh, Matt Karkin. Thank you. I miss, miss saw that. I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name, but um, uh, uh, <laughs> take comfort in the fact that nobody gets my name right. Uh, so, um, so thank you again for your support. I'm going to read your question. In a recent Q&A, you talked about Sam Harris and mentioned that his meditation practice is too focused on transforming the mind, but not on transforming how the world reveals itself. Uh, to one's mind. Could you elaborate more on ways, on the ways how medication, uh, meditation can be adjusted to focus more on the latter, transforming the world, or on other practices that could be employed for that purpose? Maybe you could also point to some guidance on how to do that practice, guided meditation course by you or someone else. Um, so uh, one thing, and, and I've argued this, and I published a paper uh, with Leo Ferraro on this, a chapter in the book uh, on um uh, that's what's it called? Hypnosis and meditation towards a, con a, 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 a what is it? Towards a science of conscious planes, I think is what it's called. Um, and there's an article in there on mindfulness. And we argued that uh, the meditative practice of stepping back and looking at the mind, and I made a similar argument in, in, the, in the video series, should be complemented uh, with contemplative practices that are meant to look out into um how the world is disclosing itself to you. Now, of course, you're transforming the mind, but the, the goal there is to transform the mind in such a way 
that you're transforming how the world is disclosed to you. Um, so meta is a practice uh, like that. And what you do in that practice is um, you can do it uh, either imaginatively or you can do it literally, but let's say it imaginatively, you would call up the image of somebody in your life and then you direct uh, a sort of open heartedness towards them. Not, that's not the goal, although I think some versions of a loving kindness uh, contemplative practice misrepresent that as a goal. It's a method. It's meant to put you into a state of openness and receptivity. And what you're trying to do is become aware of the identity you're assuming and the identity you're assigning, that whole co-identification process, uh, because that, of course, is affecting how the world is able to disclose itself to you. If your identity is locked, and the right and, and and then it's locked to right the identity you're assuming is locked and then it's locked to the identity you're assigning that thing's ability to disclose itself to you in new ways is seriously truncated and hampered your salient landscape is is sort of really boxing it in almost like in the nine dot problem so one of the practices uh, you can do is a meta practice and you can uh, you can buy books on how to do that or loving kindness um there is also, um, in the, from the Buddhist tradition, there's what's called contemplating the marks of existence in which you enter, you first get into a meditative, meditative state, but then you direct your attention outward and you try to, for example, contemplate how everything is interconnected or how um, everything is impermanent. You try to realize that, not think it or believe it, but realize it as phenomenologically present in your experience so, so that the world can reconfigure how it discloses itself uh, to you. Um, I also find that uh, for me, Lexio Divina, the sacred reading is a way in which um, I can use text, sacred texts, um, uh, to um, be a medium and a vehicle through which uh, reality can disclose itself uh, to me in different ways. Um, uh, so there's some excellent books on Lexio Divina out there. They're mostly from a Christian a tradition. There are some versions of it also from within a Neoplatonic tradition. Um, I will at some point uh, do uh, some instructional videos on some more of the meditative practices, contemplative practices, Lexio Divina. Um, you also want to do a moving practice uh, of some kind uh, that gets you involved uh, with like, like moving Tai Chi and gets you involved with other people, uh, sparring, and, because that also uh, opens that machinery up to having the world uh, disclosed in a more uh, flexible manner. Uh, and 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 uh, and again, uh, one of the, one of the things I'm working on really um, seriously right now, with the help of a lot of great people, is uh, trying to understand authentic uh, relating practices, authentic discourse, and, and this whole notion uh, of trying to get the meta technology of dialectic, because dialectic was precisely directed towards opening up, trying to get the process of anagage going so that the world can open itself up in conjunction with how the psyche is opened up. And that happens in a mutually accelerating fashion. Uh, so those, that's, a whole, those, that's a whole set of practices um, that I think you could consider uh, for trying to create a state of mind and a state of being, because it's not just a state of mind, it's a state of, right, such a state of co consciousness or cognition, it's also a state of, you know, how, of, of, of identification of existential mode um, uh, that you can cultivate in order to afford the world uh, disclosing it, itself to you uh, in uh, a more ongoing and perhaps deeper fashion. So uh, here's uh, another question uh, from Mackenzie uh, Leavitt. Uh, does the reality that is disclosed in relationship have its own ontological status? So that's a that's I think that's a really that's that's a very good question. Um, so I I've, I've tried to indicate that I think so. And I tried to coin uh, the term transjective. Uh, to indicate uh, the the ontological status of things like affordances, uh, because of course the the fact that the you know the the, the, the glass is the mug is graspable is not just a property of it, not just a property of me, but a real relationship between me and this. Is, of course, goes back to Gibson. It's a sort of a central um, example uh, of this. But there's other, there's many ways. There's many other ways like fittedness, biological fittedness, uh, is a real relation. Um, so I think it has a, an ontological status, and that's what I've called the transjective. And I've tried to argue that um, 
the 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 problem is uh, the words. Sorry, I, I'm hesitating because we use these words in a slippery fashion. Subjective and objective are often used uh, as ontological terms, but they're often also epistemological terms. They're about ways of knowing as opposed to kinds of being, um, and we slide between them. Um, and and I, so, insofar as uh, the transjective is its own ontological category, I think it is more primordial than subjectivity and objectivity as epistemological categories. It's the ontological thing that grounds uh, the relationship between subjective and objective ways of, of, of knowing. Um, and so I do think it has its own ontological status. Um, now, I think that ultimately maps into the fact that something like structural realism is correct, in which I think what's fundamentally most real, and physics seems to be moving this way, and in fact, there's many, there's many people in theoretical physics who are very interested in the philosophical position of structural realism, because uh, what's structurally real, uh, so you can look at Ladyman's book, uh, Everything Must Go, as an example of that, and, and this is the idea that ultimately what's most real are the real patterns, the real relations. Um, and that um, we should take that as the ontological primitive and then see objects and events and, and whatnot coming out of that. I think you could make a good case, and some people have, that uh, Whitehead was arguing for something like that. So insofar as uh, transjectivity um, is a real relationship that grounds uh, subjectivity and objectivity in the way I've described, I think it is a species of um, the real relations, the real patterns that I think are ultimately the fundamental uh, building blocks. Now that's, that, that of course is a very controversial thing to say. Um, uh, the, the West from Aristotle on has tended to view objects, the things that are related as primary and then the relation as derivative, which is of course the direct opposite of what you see in uh, Eastern philosophy in which the relations uh, take priority and uh, the, the relata emerge out of the, out of the relations. Uh, and this also has to do with the fact that uh, the West uh, equates uh, realness with actuality, whereas uh, Eastern philosophy uh, sees uh, often sees uh, real possibility as more real than actuality. And so these are some very important um, contrasts. But you do see with the rise of structural realism and the discussion of real patterns, um, the very real chance that the West might be shifting to something much more analogous uh, to what has been prevalent in the East, in which uh, real relations and systems of relations uh, um, are, are the ontological ground from which everything um, else can be seen to emerge. So that's my best attempt to answer uh, the question on the ontological status of relationship. So uh, the next question is from Christina Draganetti, who is a Patreon uh, supporter. Thank you, Christina. Um, is there a bibliography for the Awakening uh, course? It would be very helpful. Um, no, we haven't made a bibliography. I, I, I'm, I'm going to do one probably at the end of the course. I do put up um, the panels, but I understand uh, having all the books listed at one point would be uh, very good. Um, so. I do hope um, to have that done, um, uh, like I say, by the, uh, by the uploading of episode 50, where we've made uh, a bibliography of all uh, the texts available. Um, I don't know, there, I, I know that Future Thinkers, they're doing a, uh, I believe it's every Monday, um, they meet and do a watch party and they're going through episodes of the Awakening to the Meaning Crisis series. Um, and they they uh, they have a link to all the course notes. I think there's a running bibliography there as well, so you might want to check uh, that out. So that that uh, that is definitely something that's going to happen. Um, there, are, like I said, there are course notes uh, because of, of the watch uh, parties that future thinkers are doing. Um, excellent discussion of my work, by the way, there uh, by the people that tune in uh, for that. I've, I've been very appreciative and grateful for that. Um, there's also some really excellent commentary, and some of it critical, but uh, um, but constructive criticism by Andrew Sweeney. He's got um, 
He's got a site, uh, on the Medium, um, where he's got a, a commentary uh, on all, uh, all all the videos, and I think it's an excellent commentary. I think it makes uh, material uh, very accessible without in any way uh, dumbing or watering it down. So I recommend taking a look at uh, uh, that excellent commentary and, and, and reflection. If you want to see some uh, more critical, uh, a more critical take by Andrew on uh, uh, on my work, you can take a look not only at some of the stuff he does in the commentary. Uh, I, Andrew is a great guy. Uh, we have a good relationship. So, uh, um, but he, uh, he and Alexander Bard, who also I have a uh, who I have a good working relationship with, uh, they did a recent uh, video. Uh, uh, on, on criticizing me um, and in comparison to uh, Jordan Peterson. Um, and then I responded, and, and I think there's some excellent discussion about that. Okay, so let's take a look at the next question from Stephen Laswell, uh, a patron. Um, thank you for your support. And uh, Jordan Hall has taken to calling me Johnny V. And, um, and I like it. Is it cool that we started calling you Johnny V? Um, so, I want there's there's a lot more to that and I I I uh, I, 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 talk, I talk to Jordan directly about this so I, I need to relate this story and I don't mean to be uh, overly personal uh, but uh, this is about how people are going to call me so I, I suppose it's appropriate to be a little bit more personal right now um, not that long ago uh, let me turn around and, and or explain. Um, I used to live um, in Whitby, and um, it was a very difficult uh, situation for me, often socially. I'm very socially phobic, and I often did not have much in common with the, the people that lived around me. They were not bad people. I'm not, I'm not judging them as people. Uh, if and when I did that in the past, I, I apologize, and I think that was wrong of me, like wrong. But nevertheless, there was a, a there was disconnect. Uh, I, I didn't belong there. Uh, and I mean, this is something that has happened to me periodically through um, my life, a realization of not belonging. It's perhaps why I got interested in relevance realization. Um, but so I used to go to uh, parties and social gatherings. Um, it was, and there was, a, uh, there was a woman there. And like we weren't friends in the sense of spending any time together outside of these social circumstances, but we, we were very friendly acquaintances. And... She was a quite high status woman. She was uh, very driven, uh, uh, you know, attractive, halo effect, very smart, um, you know, successful mother, uh, raising great kids. Uh, so she was very high, sort of high status. And she um, went out of her way to make me feel welcome when I would come to those uh, parties and gatherings. And uh, she would do that. Um, and no one had ever done this before by saying, hey, it's Johnny V, or welcome, Johnny V. Um, and that meant a great deal to me. Uh, it meant a great, great deal to me. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, not that long ago, um, she died uh, quite young and unexpected and uh, a very significant loss. Um, and so when Jordan started doing that, it called up, and you know, it's a, it's a little bit bittersweet, but it called up uh, the deep appreciation I had for, for that uh, wonderful woman. Um, and it also made me feel, because I thought it was constant, he was also welcoming me into a social situation in the same kind of manner. And so I'm deeply, deeply appreciative of, uh, appreciative of that. Um, so as long as people, um, understand that context, um, I'm very happy for people to refer to me uh, that way. I've, I, I've, I've talked to Jordan about it, um, and I've, like I said, I've expressed my uh, gratitude to him for saying that, and I've said to him, uh, I've asked him if, uh, you know, if he likes saying it, and, and I said if he wants to continue referring to me in that way, I, 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 coming from him especially, I would, really I would really like and appreciate that. But as long as people um, understand that there's a there, I understand it's playful and it's great, and, and I appreciate that. As long as people understand that, for me, all of that is there. But there's also a, a more serious depth to that appellation, uh, and as long as they respect that, and 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 the woman that uh, is called to mind by that appellation, I'm happy for people to refer to me as Johnny V. Uh, 
so thank you very much uh, for asking that question. And once again, thank you to, uh, he's becoming a good friend, um, somebody I deeply respect. Uh, thank you to, to uh, Jordan Hall. Um, so a, an, another question from a Patreon supporter. Um, so this is uh, Ivor. Thank you, Ivor, for your support. Your question is, what are the baby steps that lead from the mentality of a wanton or a, ha or a hamlet towards wisdom? Yeah, so this, this, this is, the, uh, uh, Ivor, Ivor, this, this is the, this is the question. The, I think this is the burning question right now. There's a Kairos around this. Um, um, David Fuller was in from Rebel, Rebel Wisdom uh, last week to uh, film some videos. And uh, he and I were talking, and Peter Lindbergh was there. We were talking too um, about you know this this turn towards you know practice. How do we take the, these ideas? How do we take this emerging intelligibility and translate it effectively into interaction? I mean, that's 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 the that, that is the central question. It's part of what when I'm like what, when I'm when I'm directing the After Socrates video series towards. Uh, so, I think uh, I, I think a good way, uh, and Bellman, who introduces the idea of this problem with the wanton, uh, a good way of getting into this that's, a, I think, a baby step um, is something that I talk about in this series, which is learning how to get into the flow state within movement, within interaction. Uh, the reason for that is because, first of all, the flow state is a universal um, it's a, as far as we can tell, uh, you know, there is no, you know, it, it, it's the same kind of description and evaluation and appreciation of the state across, you know, genders, socioeconomic groups, um, occupational positions, language group, all of it. You know, we find people getting into this, um, and so why is that valuable for being neither a wanton nor a uh, Hamlet? Because in the flow state, you get the you get the immersion you get the the, the contact right uh, with uh, the world that the wanted has you got you've got that immersion into the, the the contact and the interaction and the machinery of your agency but you also have what Hamlet has you have this you don't have you don't have uh, propositional metacognition, but you have this. You have the, the you have this procedural perspectival metacognition that you, because you you have tremendous flexibility. There's so much creativity and flexibility, um, and the ability to innovate on the fly. This is why you see it in martial arts and jazz. So you get you get the flexibility of Hamlet without getting right the way his continual stepping back reflection and and, and narrative self discussion monologue the soliloquy as the epitome of that is just you know enervating and then preventing him from um taking action uh, so, so you you get the that you get the positive of him you get the flexibility and the ability to redirect and innovative and be you know very intelligent i would even argue uh, deeply rational um, in your interactions and then right uh, but you get the you get you do get the the coupling to the world and the immersion and the machinery of your agency. What's so important about flow is your agency is enhanced, even while that that sort of nattering narrative ego um, drops away. The, the the continual how's my biography and how's my hair um, uh, thing in your head, which really puts to the lie that ego's claim and its narrativity as I'm running the show and without me you can't be an agent. And that's just in the end bullshit because flow universally provides counter evidence to that lie because what it shows is that can drop away and your agency is precisely enhanced and that can really also help address you know a, a tendency towards um being, being very egocentric in in your perspective so all of these things right the flow state uh helps you uh to take those baby steps beyond both the wanton and hamlet um, I would recommend uh, Slingerland's book, Trying Not to Try, because what you want to do is you want to find places where you get a very good taste for the flow state and then learn how to restructure your experience and broaden the places in which you can get into the flow state. Um, and that will help, I think, get those baby steps towards uh, some fundamental uh, aspects of the steps towards uh, wisdom. 
All right, so so we now have an announcement. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. Your support is crucial to continuing to produce these videos and for supporting the science. We're doing good find solutions in the meaning crisis. Um, and uh, I, although I'm reading what Amar has written, I'm totally behind it. Um, and I thank you, uh, and, and, uh, and I totally mean it. Um, so thank you very much for that. We're shifting to live questions from the chat. Please identify yourself as a Patreon subscriber to receive priority uh, for your question. So uh, the next question is from Patreon, uh, uh, Andrea uh, Tanridi. Um, and uh, thank you for your support, Andrea. And the question is, what do you think about animal ethics and their treatment and role in human society? That's a very, uh, that's a very important question. Um, so I thought a lot about this and I've reflected on it in, in, in um, on my life and it, it's affected my personal practice. So I try to understand, uh, sorry, I'm trying to answer the question about what I think, but I'm trying to also justify it in terms of argumentation because of course, uh, you know, uh, this is something that around which is there, around which is controversy. I try to understand one of the, the sort of one of the primary projects of an ethical way of life is to uh, to protect and uh, to protect, produce, promote uh, meaning making creatures. Um, for reasons that I've, I've argued here in Q&A and I've argued on the series, I think we are wired to find, I think we are wired to find um, meaning making and meaning makers inherently valuable. And I think that is the ultimate grounding, of the, the, you know, the mitzvah, the, the with others uh, that Heidegger talks about. I think it's the ultimate grounding of, of ethics. Uh, the ethical is that which um, reliably helps um, to produce, uh, protect and promote uh, meaning making and meaning makers. So I think that insofar as we have good evidence for organisms being capable of such meaning making, uh, we have a uh, obligation to them, even though they might not be able to reciprocate with justice to us, because justice is only capable where there's reciprocity uh, uh, between moral agency. So I don't think uh, we can expect justice, for example, from animals. Um, but nevertheless, we should extend um, ethical uh, obligation towards them. Now that gets it. That, that that of course is always the question about where the where the morality grounds in the metaphysics and the ontology. I'll tell you how I've thought about this, uh, and I'm I don't think I can have. I, I I think my position is a plausible one, but I do not I, I do not think it forecloses, and I'm not trying to foreclose on bringing this into discussion or other people's position. I've taken to not eating creatures for which we have good reason to believe there is intelligence because I think of intelligence as the behavioral marker of relevance realization and that relevance realization um, is uh, the, the, the ultimate grounding of, of what we, uh, of the meaning making we're talking when we're talking about uh, existential kinds of meaning. Um, so I don't eat, for example, mammals. Uh, so, um, I don't eat octopus. Uh, it doesn't come up, but I wouldn't eat crow. Uh, no pun intended, by the way, no idiomatic pun intended there. Uh, but because of Calvary and crow's intelligence. Um, so I mean, th 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 that's very clear. I mean, uh, uh, you know, and that comes up because I eat sushi. An, oct an octopus, I think, is more intelligent than a dog. I mean, there's pretty clear evidence about that. I, I, you know, and that's why um, I, can't, I can't see myself, I couldn't see myself eating a dog or a cat. I think most people would agree with that. And I think it's then saying, well, but I'm okay with eating a pig, um, I, that strikes me as just, um, not, it's not defensible. Uh, the reasons for which, for which you wouldn't eat a dog or a cat seem to also preclude you eating a pig. Now, whether or not we, that should be extended, I do eat uh, chicken. I'm not convinced that they have uh, very much intelligence. I could be wrong about that. Uh, I'm open to that. I do not want to get flooded 
uh, with emails from vegans. Uh, on this. I, 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 please, I, 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 there's vegans in my family and I talk to them on a regular basis. I understand a lot of these positions. I do reflect on them. I have revised my position and my eating habits. I'm not, as I said, I'm not for closing. But what I'm trying to say is that I know that these all of these positions have a lot of emotional, um, a, a lot of em, a, emotional resonance and value to them, and, and, and as they should. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is answer the question as honestly and thoroughly as I can. So for me, I have tried to take what seems to me well evidenced, plausible accounts of creatures that do not, uh, sorry, that do clearly have uh, the intelligence that gives them the kind of meaning making that I find inherently valuable. Um, and therefore I extend uh, moral privileges to them. Now this is on a continuum, right? If we, if human beings, if their lives are at risk and their only way they could survive were to kill mammals, like perhaps, uh, you know, certain indigenous communities, um, then of course, if that's the only way um, if, uh, in which they can survive and not starve, um, then I, th I think that becomes a legitimate thing. Um, so I think it's important that we, we figure out how to talk about this uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very coherent manner. Um, and this is a place in which I don't want to sound too imperialistic, but there's a place in which cognitive science could really help make a difference. I think until we get very clear on consciousness and cognition and intelligence and meaning making, um, we, we should stop making absolute claims about how we should um, make our, uh, undertake our ethical practices. I think we should do what I've tried to do here. I think we should make plausible, we should make plausibility arguments and then try to be consistent around them. We have to address this issue. We can't put it off because it's not only animals, the emergent artificial general intelligence is eventually going to get to the status where we're going to have to uh, raise this question as well for those machines, the, right? And so um, let's, why not do it now? So we've got really good practice at it for when the inevitable machines arrive, uh, we'll have a, a, a better repertoire of skills uh, for addressing it. Um, and knowledge for addressing it. And then along the way, maybe we'll treat um, our fellow organisms uh, uh, more appropriately. All right. So here's a question from uh, a patron, Rob. Uh, thank you for your support. If you were to change one or two things about the nature of public education or college education to afford better growth and future fittedness of young people to society, what would you do and why? It could be as radically different from today's system of education as you like. <laughs> well, thank you for that permission, uh, Rob. Um, so if I could change, I, I think I, we need to do, we need to bring back what we've lost. We, we had a knowledge institution and a wisdom institution and they were coupled together and there was cross pollination, cross fertilization between them. And then the Protestant Reformation and a bunch of other things shut, shut down the monasteries and then the university attached to the state um, as opposed uh, to the monastery. And um, I think that has been very problematic uh, because we have lost places uh, for which people, in which people can cultivate uh, wisdom, uh, self-transcendence, uh, uh, pursue the understanding of the knowledge that they've acquired, uh, figure out how that translates into existential modes, uh, interactional relationships. All of that uh, has been lost. So if I could do one thing, and this is radical, we need to bring something back like what the monastery was. Now, of course, uh, because of the pluralist, pluralist society we're in, and I, I'm not trying to in any way undermine that, I think we need to do something like a, a, a secular monastery, so maybe like what Daniel Thorson is doing, uh, where you have the monastic academy, uh, where it's not tied to a particular religious tradition or religious institution, uh, and uh, that gives people ne nevertheless something that they can do in conjunction uh, with the acquisition of knowledge that they're doing at the university. And we might want to do, you know, uh, something even uh, preparatory of that, uh, at the at the high school level, if we could, um, other society is like when I say that I know lots of people are out there rolling their eyes, right? And it's like 
other cultures have and still do and all our culture did uh, for a very long time so there's nothing sort of natural or the way it has to be uh, about the way we do it now um, and so it, it would uh, it would be good if we thought about how um, wisdom can be brought into education I know Robert Sternberg has done a lot of work on this um, about how to bring uh, wisdom into uh, the educational situation. Uh, he also has, I think, a recent book on how to apply wisdom to the uh, to world's problems to try and show the value that such an education could bring uh, to people as being citizens, uh, good citizens of the world, not just sort of uh, efficacious agents within their own life. Uh, so that that was a ch that would be something a change I would like to see. So uh, now I want to move to a question from. Uh, a patron, Connor. Thank you for your support, Connor. Uh, what do you make of the apparent trend over Western civilization in the art world of shifting from the genre of tragedy to that of horror? Aside from the increased visceral potential of modern artistic mediums, how would you explicate the cultural and psychological shifts in emphasis here, especially as it relates to alienation agency and the meaning crisis? Um, so I already uh, alluded, Connor, to some of this when the the, uh, the discussion I had about uh, Joker, um, and uh, because the Joker, of course, uh, sits right on horror. Uh, uh, I don't think this is any spoilers because it's abstract enough. But the, 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 there's there's the opposite of dramatic irony when you're watching Joker. Like him, you don't know in the movie what's real. And that's constantly when you things start to get stabilized, the movie shuffles them and you think you've got sort of, oh, that's the correct political labeling for that. Or this is really happening. And then the movie shuffles it around and it puts you in this constantly right tenuous grasp of yourself, of the main character, which, of course, uh, with whom you, of course, it's a movie you're identifying to some degree. Um, and, and then the world of the movie. So there's this horrific element um, in it. Not, and I don't mean just the violence, I mean that sense of what's real here and that this is so unstable, yet it's compelling and I'm, I'm drawn in. It's, it's very much, it has some of that numinous aspect uh, of horror to it. And I think why horror is becoming more prevalent is, is precisely because it indicates, as I've said, it indicates that the, the, loss of a sense of contact and connection has gone from being a dull ache to being a throbbing pain. And I think what you see in Joker, for example, is pain that is not ameliorated, but eventually identified with as giving the only last possible motivation which is I'm going to burn the world because then my pain and the world once again are connected. Um, and so that I think is a very worrying uh, trend uh, that we're, we're seeing. I think the horror is also an attempt to intensify uh, that sense of absurdity and alienation uh, it, because our culture in general tries to retrieve significance, being significant with having intensity. Our culture is beset by, there's no depth to this, so what I'll do is make it as intense as possible. Uh, so like, if I can overstimulate you and overwhelm you, that is the last gasping shadow, right, of God. It's, right, it's, you used to be something which filled you with awe, and overwhelmed you. Oh, there's, there, there's nothing of that. So what we can do, though, is we can just it make it so intense, so visceral, so stimulating that that intensity, at least momentarily, gives you a surrogate uh, for the depths of significance. But notice, notice the that you know the hallmark you find in people like Jesus and Buddha, where they talk about. The peace that paths us all understanding, to use Jesus' word, Buddha, the Buddha said a very similar thing, as the hallmark of the genuine experience of significance and depth. There is no so, such peace of understanding, the peace that paths us understanding in these horror uh, genres. And the fact that we can no longer find peace 
and that we can no longer find significance. And all we can pursue is the intensity that um, ma masks the lack of peace and pretends, so pretentious, uh, to be the depths of significance, I think points to the fact that the meaning crisis is accelerating um, not just in its pervasiveness, but in its profundity in terms of the pain it's inflicting on people. So uh, this is the last question. So this is from uh, patron subscriber, uh, subscriber uh, Mahalie uh, Bordoli. Thank you for your support. Uh, do you think peer coaching or peer mentorship could be part of the ecology of practices needed to address the meaning crisis due to their scalability? Yes, very much. Um, uh, this, uh, this, um, this came up explicitly. I, as some of you know, I've been engaging in um, circling practices uh, with other people, particularly uh, 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 in part, uh, sort of ethnographic uh, partnership with Peter Lindbergh. And uh, Peter pointed out something that he found uh, that I had said in one of the circling practices as very, very sort of um, helpful. Uh, I mentioned that in circling, what you're creating is peers, and then I was, I was, I said you sort of you want to play on the word peer because it also means peer also means to look deeply uh, into it, and I think uh, uh, creating peerage is a way to get uh, distributed cognition to generate a, a flow state uh, that exaps uh, the collective intelligence uh, we need in order for um, uh, addressing. Um, the project, as Jordan Hall said, of trying to um, create in both a top-down and bottom-up fashion and shepherd and husbandry of an ecology uh, of practices for addressing and ameliorating uh, the meaning crisis. So I, I think, yes, and, and their scalability is very important uh, precisely because I take uh, Paul Van der Klee's criticism um, that any attempt to... I don't, I don't see myself as trying to replace, but I'll just use that term for now. You need to attempt to try and replace religion with sort of a secular alternative uh, faces the fact that the religions have figured out uh, how to be scalable um, uh, in, in a very profound way. And so finding, I think scalability is an important normative standard that we should hold any purported uh, ecology of practices to if we want it to be able to uh, uh, address uh, the meeting crisis. So I want to thank you all for joining me on uh, in this Q and A. As always, it was um, very enjoyable. The questions are <laughs> always so interesting, and I, you know, there's so many more I wanted to get to. Uh, but uh, as always, uh, time is the thief that steals away our life. Um, we're doing uh, these every. Uh, third Friday of the month, just so you guys, uh, any of you guys have just come to this for the first time, um, you can plan if you uh, if you want to be involved again. Um, uh, and uh, thank you again for the subscribers over Patreon. Um, as you know, I'm not taking income from this. I, I, it goes into the Reiki Foundation and it goes back into it's helping to finance the, the next series and the work that's being done in the lab um, and the Consciousness and Wisdom Study Lab. And um, you can, of course, if you want to start, and it would be greatly appreciated to support my work on the meaning crisis, you can go to uh, patreon.com uh, 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 slash John Ravicki uh, and join if you want to support the work I'm doing. So I want one more time uh, to uh, thank all of you. And again, thank uh, Amar and Karina, my tech team, for their wonderful uh, support. I couldn't do it without them. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again um, for our next Q&A. Thank you very much.